Hi, my name is Mike Gaben, and welcome to episode 20 of my KSP campaign. And in this particular episode, what we're going to be doing is landing on the moon for the first time. An unmanned landing, but still a significant event, I think, in anybody's campaign. But before we get to that, I do have some other business that I need to take care of, a little bit of redemption, let's say. What you see here is a slightly redesigned Otter 2. Uh, the last time you saw this particular plane, it ran into fuel issues when it tried to get to a location that was about a thousand kilometers away and up to an altitude of about 20 kilometers. So what I've done is put fuel tanks on those wings rather than just simply simply uh, fuselage parts that we had before. So these, these things on the side contain fuel as you can see here and of course there's a third fuel tank at the front and then there's a fourth fuel tank at the back whose job it is to feed that rocket engine uh, and that's what gives me the boost to get to the higher altitude now one of the things I ran into as well is that rocket engine ran out of fuel it seems to only be able to uh, drain it from that rear tank so I'm gonna make that rear tank the um, the last tank that's going to get drained and then balance the fuel amongst the other three tanks. So this thing has quite a bit more range than it did before. And so to test its capabilities, I'm going to fly it out to the North Polar Ice Cap and see how that goes. Looking here at the interior texture, you can see I'm getting texture issues again. That's the stock, I believe that stock, that uh, flight guide up there at the top and that black square that shouldn't be there there should be a set of crosshairs and stuff in there I don't know why I keep getting texture issues I've, I've completely removed I've never even installed on this particular install active texture management or any kind of texture compression software and that's a stock texture I'm pretty sure up there at the top so I put this uh, I put basically the same thing from raster prop monitor on this front screen so it, effectively it doesn't really uh, change any tech in anything in fact this one's easier to read anyway but I, I don't know I, I, it's kind of bugging me if anybody has any input as to why I'm losing these interior textures uh, you know or any advice on how I might fix them uh, please let me know I mentioned at the beginning of this the word redemption and I suppose part of it has to do with this particular vessel uh, failing in its mission last time to be able to travel a decent distance and be able to get up to the altitude for which it was designed for. So I want to prove that it can do it. So that's part of the reason why I'm going to go to the North Pole, or not to the actual pole, but at least to the polar ice cap. Uh, and then I want to fly up to 20 kilometers altitude or so in about there, do a pressure scan because I've yet to do a high altitude pressure scan, um, and just show that this vessel can be effective at what it was designed to do. And so you can see here we got our, our pilot, Valentina, but Valentina has another uh, source of redemption, and that is that we lost a pilot last episode. We lost Ridfell. We lost Ridfell when his vessel, the Otter 1, crashed on the runway due to, well, there was an aerodynamic issue, and if you want, you can go take a look at that episode if you haven't seen it, uh, and, and it explains exactly what happened. But the end of it is, well, Ridfell was gone. So Valentina is doing this particular mission for Ridfell and showing that uh, in atmosphere jet propulsion is still a safe way for us to get around. So after about an almost an hour of game time flight we are coming within sight of the North Polar Ice Cap. I always kind of like the look of this, <laughs> the North Polar Ice Cap like this. It's such a distinctive biome. It's definitely, at least from spotting it from the air, it's one of the easier ones to spot from the air, that's for sure. And of course, when I say an hour of in-game time, uh, flight time, um, a lot of that was done at two times speed, and I think I might have even gone up to three times speed, so it's not like I've been playing for an hour by the time I got to this point. But it was a long flight nonetheless. But we are now closing in on our destination. And here we are coming in for our landing. You know, one of the great things about uh, the ice caps is just how flat they are. You can pretty much land anywhere without too much difficulty. They are certainly much flatter than that tier one runway, that's for sure. But anyway, coming in close, I can just barely see the altitude. 10 meters, so I can see the shadow. There we go, touchdown. 
Nice, and uh, yeah, apply the brakes, come to a stop. It does a bit for this thing to stop because it is particularly heavy, but in the meantime, we can start collecting science. This, in fact, knocks off the second last biome on Kerbin that I need to visit. I only have one more, and that is the Badlands. And uh, yeah, I'll probably fire when this thing's all uh, rebuilt again in a few days, I'll probably end up doing that one too. But once all our science was collected, it was time to get on out of here. And then there's just one part left of this mission, which is to get above 18 kilometers to be able to do a high altitude pressure scan. I should mention, by the way, that uh, I don't have any uh, contracts associated with this at all. This is completely uh, just a science gathering expedition, I guess we'll put it that way. Um, and the reason why, by the way, I could have done that high altitude uh, pressure scan pretty much anywhere. It just says high altitude pressure scan. It's not over any particular biome. I could have done it right at the beginning. But I'm doing it here at sort of the furthest point out in my mission for a couple of reasons. Number one is that I wanted to test that I could do it, that I could fly at about, it's, I'm about a thousand kilometers now from the KSC, that I could fly that distance and still get up to 20 kilometers because that's where the mission failed last time I had this vessel um, and the other reason actually it should be more efficient doing it this way because I have burnt off a large amount of my fuel so the vessel is now lighter and it should have an easier should be able to burn less fuel to get up to the required altitude than it would have uh, when the vessel was heavier and fuel laden which is was which is what it was at the beginning of this particular mission so I've got myself heading south, which of course is the direction I want to go to go back to the KSC. Um, I'm up to my cruising altitude and I'm just building up speed as much as I can before I fire up that rocket engine, but I think I'm getting pretty close now. Yeah, let's do this thing. There we go, we're off pitch up. I'm not gonna go up to a pitch of 90 degrees, which you've seen me do before, because every other time I've done this, um, I was interested in doing it over a specific waypoint. Here, all I want to do is get to altitude. So, you know, I'll pitch up steeply, but I kind of want to make my uh, trajectory not straight up, but kind of more parabolic. It'll be easier for me to level off. Anyway, Apoapsis is now over 19 kilometers. Shut down that rocket engine, restage it so that it won't fire up again. Raising up. Almost at 18 kilometers, should be able to do a pressure scan. There it is, pressure scan. And now I'm just gonna keep this arc going. Follow it across the top. Oh, oh my engines just flamed out. <laughs> That's okay, not a problem. They should come back once the air gets a little bit thicker again. So uh, right now we have no power or no thrust. No worries. Everything's fine. He'll come back. We're just coming down. Is this, by the way, the way they uh, simulate zero G with much, much bigger planes than this, with cargo planes, but basically following this sort of thing where you pitch yourself up, you turn off the, oh, oh yeah, this plane with the temperature gauges, everything seems fine. You know, and, and, and then in this arc, if you just follow that prograde vector, you get nice zero Gs. Waiting for those engines. Leveling off a little bit. I don't want to come down too steeply. Wow, those engines are taking a long time. Come on. Fire, like... Ah, there they go. All right, now it's just a question of uh, giving myself a little bit of thrust, leveling this flight off, and getting myself back home. So here we are closing in on the Kerbal Space Center. Still over 5,000 meters per second of Delta V left. I know it looks like the fuel reserves are very low, but they really aren't. And, and, and I never even started with all the tanks full, by the way. I wanted to save weight and... Uh, those uh, tanks that are on the wings were actually less than half full when I started with. So I'm very, very pleased with this. Last time I flew this particular plane, um, not only did it not have enough fuel to reach the altitude that I wanted to, it didn't need, I, and then I, I had to land it right where it was. Here, 
reached the altitude that I wanted, got itself back to K, uh, Kerbal Space Center, comfortably put it back on the runway, full recovery cost on the vessel. Uh, only thing I spent was that fuel cost. So uh, even though there were no contracts associated with this, this was a very worthwhile mission for me. Indeed, uh, 57.1 science earned on that mission puts me over 114 science, which is going to allow me to unlock another tech node. And this time I went with fuel systems, um, mostly for the bigger tank, or for bigger tanks, but mostly for these fuel lines, will allow, which will allow me to build some rockets that are a little bit more sophisticated. Though I really do need to get some bigger engines too. So I think probably that will be my next target after this. And before we get to the main event, I got one more thing to show you. This is the first stage of ComSat 5, which was inserted a couple of episodes ago. And if you recall, I forgot to uh, engage the parachute. So this thing is by no, it's gonna, is not going to get recovered. It's just going to burn up in the atmosphere. But you might recall that uh, I've been having a bit of trouble um, with stage recovery, removing debris, uh, that enters into the atmosphere if velocities are greater than two kilometers per second. This guy you can see has already maxed out at a velocity of a little bit over 2.3 kilometers per second and has, you know, goes into the atmosphere tumbling and bumbling and burning and everything without really ever getting close to anything overheating and exploding. So what I think I'll do is I'll get back into the stage recovery settings and set this to 2.4 kilometers per second. So anything entering into the atmosphere that is not the focus vessel at over 2.4 kilometers per second will assume to be burned up in the atmosphere and destroyed. Anything less than that, well, it's up to whether I put enough parachutes on it and stuff like that, whether stage recovery will recover it. And I think, I think that's a consistent number with uh, how the uh, shock heating model is working within Kerbal Space Program. So let's sip forward a couple of days to Muna 2, uh, just about to complete its circularization to put itself into low carbon orbit. I'm not going to show you the ascent. Uh, the ascent for this is, you've seen me do so many ascents and this is just the same old story as the previous ones. Um, but uh, let's talk a little bit about Muna 2. Um, once it's into low carbon orbit, it ends up with about 2600 meters per second of delta V left, which is quite a lot. And its mission is to land on the moon. Um, and if, well, we'll just go through some numbers really quickly as far as planning moon ascents or moon landings. Um, the transfer from low curve in orbit out to the moon is about 816 meters per second. To get a low orbit capture around the moon is about 310 meters per second and then finally landing on the moon well, it all depends on how good you are i suppose I'm, i don't feel like i'm really all that good so i like to budget myself around 750 meters per second and if you add that all up that comes up to 2190 meters per second which is about 400 meters per second less than what this thing has so i've got tons of fuel and actually that is done on purpose the reason is is because i wanted to not just do uh some science in just a single bio but once i've landed once i would like to uh to do a little suborbital hop to a neighboring biome and hopefully get some science out of both biomes. And when I say science, actually, I only say temperature scans. That's the only piece of assignment uh, science that I have. I didn't bring the mystery goo or the uh, materials bay. I find the science return when you transmit them is pretty poor. Um, so I, I don't want to lug them along. I'll do that when I do a manned mission. Um, and the barometer is completely useless on the moon, so I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to use a maneuver node to uh, set up my transfer burn to the moon. I select the moon as a target. And the other thing I like to do is uh, view from the moon. You right click on the moon and you say view from here. And then you get this nice uh, view of your approach. And what I like to do is to actually get my periapsis in as close as I can, ideally in around the 10 to 12 kilometer range. The, the closer you are to the, if you're going to go into a low lunar orbit anyway, the closer your burn is most efficient, the closer you are to the body that you are transferring to. That's uh, a little something called the O-birth effect that we will most certainly talk about uh, later on in this series. When you do these burns with maneuver nodes, you always want to split the burn 
on equal side of the actual time. So you start uh, when you are half the length of the burn away from the time. To be honest, I was a little slow on the draw here, and uh, I'm going to blame this on my eldest son. He was actually on the screen beside me while I was doing this playing Super Smash Brothers. I was distracted, but the, the, this ended up necessitating actually a little bit of a correction burn, but uh, no, it was a lots of fuel, as I've been saying, so uh, that was okay, and I got the uh, encounter that I wanted. Few more little puffs. There, that's the beauty. There we go. Perfect. Well, perfect. Whatever. More than adequate. We'll call it that. So uh, yeah, now it's just time to uh, hit on out there. And uh, I know. Um, oh yeah, I got to set my antenna because the communitron won't be able to communicate all the way back to Kerbin. So I got to set the dish antenna communicate back to Kerbin. Uh, remember I do have communication satellites that are automatically that are already pointed to the moon so that's all I got to do for my communication. And then we'll use alarm clock to set an alarm for when I go to transfer across the uh, the sphere of influence into the moon. Now we got three contracts that this mission is going to do. Uh, we have an orbit the moon, we have a collect science data around Kerbin, which actually I'm going to do right now. Notice that I actually have no science to transmit, but it goes green anyway. <laughs> you actually don't have to transmit any science. You could just take some science and it's zero still counts, so that's nice. And then we finally have for our final uh, contract on this mission is this test the LV-1 ant engine. Uh, on a suborbital trajectory to the moon. And if that sounds familiar, I've had this particular contract on my uh, back for a long time. In fact, um, that's what Muna 1 was supposed to do and utterly failed at it. So this time, though, we're going to make sure we do it uh, correctly. Now, you might be noticing as well, oh, just changing the sphere of influence here. There's the alarm. Yep. Uh, that there is a battery up at the top there that's red, that's dang it, that happened actually during launch. Uh, batteries seem particularly fragile when it comes to dang it, so that battery sorted out, it's useless, but that's okay, this thing has tons of batteries on it. And the next step of this is to get a capture into low lunar orbit. You can use another maneuver node for this if you like, but personally I just like doing this using the information being provided from Kerbal engineer. I do it much the same way as when I circularize into, uh, on a sense, into low Kerbin orbit. Um, what I'm, except this time, what I'm looking at instead of time to apoapsis, I'm looking at time to periapsis. And I'm going to let myself get nice and close to that. And then I'm going to start to burn retrograde. And just like when I circularize around Kerbin, I don't want that time to periapsis. I want to keep that above zero. I don't want to let that get away from me but the thing is because you're burning retrograde everything is backwards so if your time to periapsis is starting to get ahead of you what you want to do is pitch up and that will bring the periapsis closer and vice versa if the periapsis is getting too close you want to pitch down to push the periapsis away from you but yeah it, it works out first fine and I ended up with this nice uh, low curve or low not low curve in orbit but low orbit about the moon and with that accomplished it's time to start thinking about where I want to put this thing down I gotta pick myself a landing spot now one thing is is I got to be on the curve side of the moon because I'm gonna be in a communication shadow on the other side and I won't have any control of it at all and what I'm kind of looking at is this kind of highland area right there uh, just ahead of that I don't know what the name what's that crater I lose track of these crater names but right there, yeah, that's about where I want to be. And then, because I'm I, looking at that, I think that's Highlands there. And if I land there, then it's a short hop into that big crater, which I know will be another biome. That seems to make some sense. Now, what I got to do is I got to time warp my way around the planet where I will lose my communication link and get to a place where I can start my descent burn. So I'm just waiting here for my communication link to pop back in once Kerbin comes above the lunar horizon. That should come back. Come on, where is it? There we go. So there we go. I got my communication back. So now it's time to just uh, time warp a little bit further and get to the spot where I want to uh, start my descent burn. I like to make my descents very, very shallow. I find I 
make them much more efficient that way. So I'll point myself retrograde and get myself ready here. Now, ooh, wait a second. I am at a very, very low altitude. I'm already, <laughs> I got to stay above 10 kilometers in my suborbital trajectory. I just realized, oh, wait, I just lost my communication link. Okay, that can't be an issue with line of sight. That, oh, oh, shoot, I got my back end pointed towards the sun. I don't think I have any electrical charge. Nope, but thankfully I have the backup battery. Yeah, I talked about that a number of episodes ago. Always keep a backup battery. Whoops, I lost my SAS, come back. Always keep a backup battery so that if you lose charge and all your other batteries, you can turn that battery on. All right, that should help me out there. <laughs> anyway, as I was saying, um, before that happened, um, I'm already in an altitude just barely above 10 kilometers, and I gotta be for the ant engine test suborbital and uh, above 10 kilometers. So I should have maybe put myself into a slightly higher orbit. So I think what I'll do, so I don't have to worry about the scent and this contract at the same time, is I think I'll point myself retrograde right now. Burn a little bit until I am just suborbital. And then I'll test the ant engine. And then I'll push my orbit back up again <laughs> and do my descent. That way I get that part out of the way and I don't have to worry about it. So there we go. We are now suborbital. I can now test the ant engine, which just is right on the very top. I didn't put it in any kind of useful position at all. I'm going to turn myself normal so at least I can get some battery charging happening. There it is. Run the test. All right, contract goes green. And now I'll shut down that engine again because that engine is not in a position <laughs> that it's going to help me. I just definitely don't want it to be firing. And then I'll just point myself prograde and push my orbit back up and really start thinking about my descents or seriously. Okay, that's looking a little... Uh, I'm really still, I think, too close to the surface near my landing site. So I'm going to push that periapsis up a little bit higher. Yeah, and then, and then what I'll do is I'll travel along a little bit and uh, and then I'll burn a little bit of retrograde just to uh, get that periapsis down but not until I'm closer to my landing site. Uh, there we go just barely suborbital and skimming along the surface here. Alright I, th I think now I'll just let myself get closer to the landing site and get ready for the final descent. Okay, so here we go. Let's take a look where we are. Ooh, getting close. Yeah, definitely getting close to where I'm gonna need to do that final descent. It looks a little, a little cratery up ahead. Yeah, looking up ahead there, I see, I, I, I think I start, yeah, I'm starting to see it's getting pretty, pretty hilly up there. So I think I'll start arresting my horizontal velocity now aiming for that sort of flat area just beyond the crater that's coming up. So I'm just throttling up. I'm keeping my pitch at zero because all I'm interested in right now is just killing off horizontal velocity. You can actually keep track of your horizontal speed with, with Kerbal Engineer. I'm just about at 250 meters per second horizontal velocity. So you can also get a pretty good idea of it just watching the retrograde vector on the nav ball. As it moves upward, you have less and less horizontal velocity. Yeah, that looks pretty good. That's all right. The other thing you can take a look at is the suicide burn distance that's provided by Kerbal Engineer. It's a useful number, just about uh, closing in on 2.3 kilometers. Uh, if you burn, right when that gets down to zero, burn full out with uh, aiming pure retrograde, then you will theoretically do a perfect landing. I have nowhere near the gumption to do that. So I'm burning now, in fact, because it's starting to look a little hilly and I like the ground that's below me. So I am burning and I'm pushing that retrograde vector up to the top of the nav ball. Yeah, that's kind of the idea. You want to get yourself falling vertically. Definitely by the time you get to the surface, you want to be going vertically just straight down, no horizontal velocity at all. So there we go. We are just falling now. And looking at my suicide burn distance, it's at about 500 meters. It, it's nice. If that number ever goes negative, you're in a heap of trouble. But it's nice to have that there, just sort of a comfort thing. I think I'll start arresting my velocity there a little bit. Why am I? 
Okay, it's at the top. I am definitely moving sideways. Oh, what's going on here? Why am I going sideways? I'm really close because I can see the shadow. And oh my gosh, I'm on... Oh, jeez. Okay, well, well, abort, abort. <laughs> okay, what happened there? I had the nav ball on orbit mode, so my velocity was my orbital velocity still. It wasn't relative to the surface. Now it's relative to the surface, so that helps. Okay, here we go. Coming down and touch down. Yeah, despite all the shenanigans, came down without too much of an issue. And the only science I have to do is that lonely temperature scan. That's it. So there we go. Only a 14.4 science off from the temperature scan. And yeah, I'm in the Midlands, not in the Highlands, as it turns out. That's about all I can do. So now it's time to start thinking about doing myself a little hop. And if you look, I have 724 meters per second of Delta V still left. Tons and tons and tons. I should be able to hop on over there without any issue whatsoever. So I want to kind of go east and south. East and south is definitely the way I want to go. Okay, ready to go, and we're off. What I'm going to do is immediately pitch towards the east and somewhat to the south, and then I want to look here, and just sort of keeping it sort of on that prograde vector, looking at my trajectory. I want to go a little more south than that. I want to pull it south, pull it south, pull it south, and that's looking pretty good. Look at my Apple. Oh, my Apple apps is 14 and a half kilometers. That's too high. You know, really, there's no need to let the Apple apps get up. I could have gotten away with it half that height. And in fact, what would have been the more efficient thing to do would have been to cut my throttle earlier and then let it drift up towards Apple apps and then just burned horizontally to push the trajectory out if I wanted the trajectory to go further along. But that's okay. Again, like I said, lots of fuel left, 467 meters per second left. The suicide burn is only in around 180 meters per second, so I theoretically have more than twice the fuel that I need. So we'll just time warp up here to the top of our apoapsis. Here we go. We are starting to go back down. Turn this thing the right way. And then it's just the same process as before. You want to you kill that horizontal velocity off. You want to... Uh, herd or get that um, retrograde vector up to the top of the nav ball. Okay. And what are we here? About 300 meters from the surface. And just make sure you're falling straight down. Keep an eye on that suicide burn distance. Don't let it get negative. And easy peasy. Lots of fuel to go and touchdown. In fact, I know for a fact that I don't have nearly enough fuel to do this again and get to a third biome, so that is going to have to be the end of it. So we do our temperature scan. We are on the East Crater. Now I know what the name of the crater is. East Crater, another 14.4 science. That doesn't seem hardly worth it. Regardless, that's going to have to bring this mission to a close. I guess there were three contracts that were finished off with this mission, so... You know, all of that, I suppose, was worth it. But uh, that's not only going to end this mission, but also going to have to end this particular episode. I thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.